Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session on traffic engineering in SD-WAN. Even though we have uh, some limited time, we will try to cover as much as possible and get some important details out of what is SD-WAN offering. So before we move on to the actual topic of today, some information about us. Who are we? We are an online and offline technical training institute that is offering expert level training into networking domain. So we are widely recognized for the security and we also have name in enterprise and this data center as well. About me, I'm Saif Deshmukh. I'm CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Certified and my number is 67714. I got more than seven years of experience as a network engineer and more than four plus years of experience as SD-WAN implementation engineer. I work for Cisco Gold Partner to deploy SD-WAN uh, for more than four years, actually. My journey began back in 2016 when I began my career as a, as a network trainer. Since then, I've been sharing my knowledge and uh, passion for networking with others who aspire to excel in this field. So before we talk about the traffic engineering, right, which is specifically the feature related to the SD-WAN for today, let us talk about why we actually have SD-WAN. To understand that, we have to understand the inefficiencies that the traditional WAN is offering. So in the recent years, the businesses have started acquiring the cloud uh, more and more, right? Many applications have moved uh, to the public cloud and many services. There are some examples like ERP, that is can be hosted on AWS, Office 365 can be used over internet. And the company specific applications are hosted over the data center. A company wanted to reduce the cost and manage their infrastructure more effectively, right? However, the traditional WAN was designed to connect users at remote sites. Remote sites as in, so you used to have a data center and you would have, right, branches and you would be connecting, you would be, uh, for example, right? You might have an MPLS. MPLS is kind of a wide area network. It was mainly designed to connect your branches to the data center and use an application that is hosted over the, uh, over the DC. So there are some problems that we started having, right? Well, at that time when MPLS came, it was a big thing. But as applications started moving towards from the DC to the cloud, right? We wanted to have uh, some different solution. The available option that we had had a problem with the cost because increased bandwidth demands uh, more uh, the more and more application moving towards the cloud. As a result, you wanted more and more bandwidth. And we know that that these WAN circuits are very expensive. They cost you for per MBs, right? So these are very expensive. The another problem that we were having that uh, when we were moving the traffic from the from the site to the DC right, and then it is going to the cloud, then there would be higher latency because we are moving the traffic from the remote site to the data center and then to the cloud because the longer the path is there, the higher the latency of the delivery for the communication, right? And there was another problem that is availability. Running everything through the company's data center creates a single point of failure because if this DC went down, every other site that is dependent on that site or that data center now don't have that communication to this application. So this is why companies started using features like direct internet access to leverage or to overcome the problem that we were having with this specific solution, right? So a velocity was another thing. The thing is when, okay, let's say your company needs an MPLS circuit. Right, MPLS is a big thing even today. I'm not saying right, this is a replacement of MPLS, but 
it's not like full solution to the problems that you are having right now. Okay. So even if you wanted to deploy the MPLS, it would it would be very time consuming for the new site that you're deploying. All right. So how do you tackle all these problems? Well, SDVAN is there, right? There might be another solution. Is so today's topic is regarding SDVAN, so we are looking at that solution. So software defined solutions, uh, like since back in 2016, a lot of companies have started jumping into it. Versa, like Cisco, Wiptela, uh, Silverpeak, uh, Juniper, and uh, you know even your VMware, Citrix. So a lot of companies have started jumping and leveraging this solution called software defined WAN. What exactly software defined WAN? It's actually following a concept of SDN. It's a, it's a part of a broader technology called the software defined networking. Okay, wait a second. So there are many uh, options available uh, out in the market. The best one is based on your um, based on your requirement, but available options out of available options, the best one is Cisco because it's offering a lot of features in regards to what problems what we have just covered in the previous slide. So among many benefits of SD WAN, the best benefit is single management plane apart from right optimized WAN service and the management from a single graphical user interface. These are just like a small uh, benefits of what actually SD-WAN is offering. You would have, so basically the SDN, the main thing, SDN have an architecture. So we know for the fact that a device is divided into the control plane and the data plane, right? So as even says, software defined networking says that control plane is to be taken out physically from the device and put under a different device called a controller. Now, pretty much all the vendors are follows, following the same thing. So the control plane of the device, of every single device, is going to be handled by a spatial device. Because of this centralized point of view, you get to manage the whole infrastructure from the centralized uh, management system. So other vendors use different systems in Cisco. To manage these devices, you get to use a manager called a vManager. This is basically the graphical user interface, where it's uh, like this. Right. So from here, let me log into it. So as you can see, I'm getting, uh, this is my central point of view for all of my sites. How many branches I have, right? How many branch devices I have and how many tunnels they are building, the IPsec tunnel between these devices. From which site to which site? What is the health, right? What is the average latency? What is the loss? So I'm seeing all this data in real time. So this is one of the cool features of what you're getting because now you're managing all these devices from a central point of view. What is the benefit of this? This is going to provide us the many benefits like business opportunities and overall better experience for the WAN circuits. Another beautiful thing about SD-WAN is the reason we are able to see all this uh, latency, loss, right? This is 
the single line represents the ip sector tunnel actually the single ip sector one of the beautiful thing about sd wan is it's, it is calculating the data in real time so you got more data to take the decision on what is the best path sd wan is designed for the wan right wide area network so it is seeing the performance of the circuits and taking that information right like jitter packet loss it is performing it is performing the routing decisions as compared as compared to the traditional one where it be the routers have just information whatever the routing protocol have given it so using those information we are going to right using that information what we are going to do we are going to perform the the routing what is the limitation of it think of it like this in the older days uh when you want to navigate to somewhere a tourist is trying to locate some locate uh some some place actually and it has lost now to find another uh another pathway to the destination right it needs to see what is it shown in the information available in that physical map paper compared to very similar to what sd wan is offering so you got so much auxiliary information you got your google map now what google map is offering google map map is giving you not only the roads uh, just plain map but it, it also offering you information like traffic jams which road is having a lot of traffic and which uh, would be the shortest way things like that so this is what sd wan is giving you not just your uh, what do you say not just information just for the sake of reachability that is what your routing does the traditional routing i, I don't care i just want to have the reachability to that site as long as i'm reaching that site that's fine but here we are taking other things into account we don't we just don't want to have the reachability but also have the better reachability and that's why sd wan is uh, giving us the faster performance compared to the traditional wan circuits in cisco you have two sd wan solution you got meraki meraki was designed for small and mid sized companies that wants simplicity deployment of meraki is not very complex so you just log into the the dashboard of meraki and right it's self explanatory and it, and it is not going to offer you a very detailed feature what viptela is offering okay this was supposed to be another company that cisco have acquired a few years back now it's like they're calling it a catalyst as divan that's why you're seeing it catalyst divan this is right bread and butter of as divan from cisco it contains more advanced features available and it requires a sophisticated network design and architecture so if you have a banking firm you would not go you would not want to go with the meraki options rather than you would want to go with the viptela options there so let's talk about this more uh, about the cisco's viptela option so in here you got four controllers well in fact the three ones are most used more used the fourth one is actually cloud based solution very similar to the cisco umbrella now we call it a v analytics so we are not going to talk about it in uh, in depth we have one controller called a v bond that actually handles the orchestration plane we are calling it now as a validator think of it like it's like the gateway to your sd wan any device right think of it like a, there is a new device that is trying to onboard itself okay it might be 8000 v router over the aws that you have deployed and it's trying to uh having the initial configuration that you have provided inside of it the v bond ip will be there it will try to reach the v bond ip this is the public leasable ip and taking that information it will try to authenticate itself it will try to present some certificates the root certificate and the device certificate 
trying to authenticating the device identity. This is even is following the whitelist model. Everything that is this device is offering, we won't already have it into its whitelist. So it will, after validation, it will offer the vSmart and the vManager IP. Now we call it the controller and manager in Catalyst as event update. Now taking that information, what we vBond have offered, we are going to form the control connections to these devices as well. The communication, the authentication that is been done with the vBond was also via that some kind of a tunnels. It's actually DTLS, or if you want, it can be of type of a DTLS connection as well. It's a tunnel, right? So they form the control connections and using these connections, they exchange the information. The information of SDVAM. So vSmart handles the control plane here. Basically, vSmart, basically think of it like a brain of the SDVAM. It's literally the simplest explanation I can give you is it acts like a route reflector in here. Route reflector means if you got one route here, let's suppose 10.10.10.0, the control pin connections very similar to when you have built between two routers, which is OSPF neighborship, and they exchange the control plane communication. The control plane is actually the routes they are sharing. Here, the Vanage router, the branch side router of SD-WAN, they don't build any control connections. Any routing information, policy information, security updates, every single thing should be received via the vSmart only. So what do they do? Branch routers have also formed the tunnels with them. Over this tunnel, they shared an update inside, very similar to OSPF, we are using overlay management protocol in SD-WAN. So we share that stuff to vSmart and vSmart in return is going to give an update to this cloud router. And from here, we will have OMP learned route 10.10.10.0 10 10 10 slash 24, like that. And they're only able to do this because their physical connectivity via might be, uh, might be via many sources, MPLS, INET, 4G, it does not matter. What is matter? Because regardless of what is the underlay here is, the means of communication to the vSmart, they have all formed the same tunnel. All of them have formed the same tunnel. Like this. So it's like connected, they're connected via point to point manner now. So whenever they want to communicate to this subnet, for example, this AWS subnet is trying to communicate to this 10.10.10 subnet, which is a branch router. What happens? Do you see this lock? That's your IPsec tunnel. They take this information and they communicate to the public IP of these branch routers. Right? But in fact, they in reality, it's not the public IP. It's actually the the IPsec tunnel they use to send the data to branch routers. Okay, I'll talk about in a moment uh, about the data plane, but let's get the grasp of how control pin is working. So vSmart is handling the control pin. To be able to understand the example that I'm gonna take for the traffic engineering, control traffic engineering, we have to understand how the vSmart works. The vManager at the other hand, Anything that we are going to manage, whether it's onboarding of the device, pushing the policies, even the policies that we we smart is going to push, we'll be creating on the graphical user interface of the vManager. And vManager is going to communicate using an API to these controllers. The controllers are going to push the information. The vSmart is going to push the information. Why is that? Because we will have a single device, whether it's a WAN router or the controller, it all are going to be managed via a single graphical user interface. That's why I said it's offering a centralized management system. So let's see how actually this demand works. Right, three, four slides we have to understand how actually this demand is working. The very first thing, 
in my new company, I would like to deploy the controllers. That's first thing. And the best thing about the controllers is that this can be deployed over the physical server on ESXi or KVM, which is also very similar to what ESXi is offering. So you have on-premises deployment. If you are doing it in your on-prem deployment, you can deploy it on your physical server, choose ESXi or KVM. It also support not only that, but it also support cloud hosted. If you want to use Azure, AWS or Google Cloud, you can deploy your vManager, vBond and vSmart controllers over there as well. So once the controllers are up and running, they have to build the tunnels with each other. These are again, the type of a DTLS type of connections. So they build this tunnel with each other. I'm not gonna go in detail of why there are specific port numbers, but let's suppose one, two, three, four, six is the number they start with. But what you should get out of this slide is each core on vManage and vSmart makes a permanent DTLS connection to the vBond. Resulting in four connections between vManage vBond and two connections between vSmart and vBond. Right? And they also form two connections between the vManage and vSmart as well. So using these tunnels, they exchange the information. When you deploy a policy, the vManage is going to share the policy to the vSmart. The vSmart is supposed to be handling everything that we tell it, tell it to. Okay, my controllers are ready. Now I want to deploy the Vanish router. Now you got multiple options in here. If you want to have an automated deployment for Cisco XCA devices, I will use PNP options. Whenever I buy a device, those devices are going to appear on Cisco's plug and play portal. PNP portal. And as soon as the device comes up, I can leverage the PNP functionality to have the automated deployment. If it's the device from the Biptela, both of them are the same thing. This type of thing, we call it a zero touch provisioning, ZTP actually. But specifically for Biptela devices, they reach out to the uh, ztp.biptela.com. If the device you have bought, from Viptela, uh, actually Viptela series, it's going to be appear in there. And in that portal of ZTP, you are going to mention if you, this device is going to communicate to the portal, it where it should be redirecting it. And that's gonna be the public IP of the vBond. As opposed to you have a manual deployment option. You can, use, you can use a bootstrap option for the Cisco series of devices that support SD-WAN. Bootstrap is having the devices, some kind of file plugged into the device and it's going to boot up with the configuration directly taking from the USB stick. Another option you have from the manual is that you can go to that device and explicitly activate. You're going to sell, yeah, this is a certificate certificate you're going to use and use this VBond. So you got a couple of methods you want to use. But regardless of it, when you, when the devices are onboarded, what do they do? Every managed router, once they have uh, right booted up, they should be considering this is the vBond. The very first thing they will do, they will try to form the DTLS or TLS type of connections. By default, it's a DTLS. And they, they are now, it might be like, this might be the internet. There might be the multiple routers in between these two devices, but now they are connected in that point to point fashion and whatever they are communicating, it is encrypted over the DTLS connection. Okay. So, okay, we have formed the, formed the connection. Now, last few things that you have to understand is some predefined VPNs that SD-WAN have. You got VPN zero by default. This is basically the transport VPN. The very interface that this device have used was part of VPN zero to begin with, okay, VPN zero. And VPN zero is, 
is going to hold not only one interface, but all the interface that is going to face the transport. It might be MPLS, the VSAT satellites, 4G, regardless of what is the connection. All of those interface you have to just put into VPN zero. This is a predefined VPN that we're going to use. Okay. And this is the interface that is going to be tunneled. Because that's the interface that's going to form IPsec tunnel with other site branch routers over the interfaces. Or the traffic over these interfaces are encrypted actually or tunneled. And this is the same interface. We reached out to the controllers and form the DTLS type of connections. If it's a control connection, it's a DTLS type of connections. If it's IPsec tunnel, we send the data packets to communicate over the branch to branch. Right, that's IPsec tunnel. This is a DTLS type of connection. Okay, another type of VPN you have is 512. This is out of band management. When you have a device, you want to reserve this VPN. Uh, you have this VPN reserved actually. You can't use it for service side or LAN side. This VPN interfaces are going to be used for in case if you want to have the connection when you have lost the inbound connection connectivity. Out of band management is that's what we use actually. So apart from this, right, we got the transport site. This is VPN zero. Okay. Well, one interface you might be having that might be the part of VPN five twelve. It's fine. But anything else apart from this will be considered as a service VPNs. That is VPN one to VPN five eleven. So if I define VPN one, it might be the guest side. It might be, you know, guest VPN. It might be that, uh, you know, VPNs are very similar to, not similar, exact thing as a VRS. So we have a misconception. VPN means we have we're forming IP sector online. We are saying VPN now. It's not that. So if I want to define uh, anything on the land side, I need to define a service VPN. I cannot use zero and five twelve though. I cannot use. I can use anything apart from this. VPN 1 to 511 and 513 onwards, some 65, some changes of uh, available option you have. 65,000, some change. So, whatever the routes you are learning, right, on the LAN side, you have an option if connected, static, as well as some dynamic routing protocols also support it on the LAN side. This is what we call a service side, and this is transport side. Okay, let's get familiar with the underlay and overlay. So when we have one device and we have defined our transport VPN, right? Using that, using either it's a default route or using MPLS, we are exchanging the BGP LAN routes or SPF LAN route, all that. We just want to have the reachability from this end to this end. And we are forming what? IP sector now. This is what we call overlay network. That means using an underlay actual IP circuit, uh, I have formed an overlay. Right? And the information that you have on this LAN side, these are the service VPN, VPN one, and VPN two. So by default, what happens? We're gonna send this to the route that you define in VPN one, you're gonna send it to the vSmart via the DTLS connection. vSmart is going to tell this router and those router is going to appear only in the VPN one of the this transport. VPN two routes are going to appear via the vSmart into VPN two routes. So to, to be able to receive the routes of VPN one, you must be having the VPN one by default. And if you want to have the VPN one route into VPN two, that's basically the route route leaking. Okay. Now, before we start with the the policies and see how actually the traffic is moving to uh, in the SD WAN, uh, some things about overlay management protocol. We just talked about when you form the DTLS connection, right? The DTLS connections with between the Vanish router and the vSmart. Manage router and the vSmart using that connection, we are going to form 
an OMP session. Think of it like you got two routers and this is the internet in between. When you form an IPsec session, they're connected, it's, it's like they're connected directly. Over this tunnel, you can form OSPF, EIGRP, like BGP, whatever you want. Right, very similar to that. Automatically, the this is basically the transport side. Automatically, the overlay management protocol is going to form the session or the neighborship with the vSmart. Yeah, now using OMP, we don't just exchange routes via the vSmart, but the routes basically are called OMP routes. Not only that, but we also distribute the transport locators. What is a transport locator? This is another type of route uh, that we create to to locate our transports. In short, they call T logs. So when one device having an MPLS circuit, let's say, and I have this MPLS circuit, automatically this vanish router is going to generate one uh, T log route. A T log route having the information of the public IP, the private IP, and uh, what keys it wants to use. Keys also part of it. That means we don't use ICCAMP to form the IPsec tunnel between these devices. Rather than we in side of our t lock routes, we add IPsec information, IPsec keys. So it's safe to say using OMP, we do key exchange in here. That is big part of it. The IPsec VPN phase, phase one is, is gone basically in SD-WAN. So when you have another interface, another circuit, that means it's also going to generate another route for that. And when you define when you define a LAN route, these are going to be sent to the vSmart via the TTLS connection. And when these vanish routers are going to receive these LAN routes, their next hop is going to be two next hops. The first one and the second one actually the circuits because they're not only receiving the land routes but also the route that we have generated for each transport, T-lock routes. So apart from the T-lock routes, the service side reachability information is also shared. There's something called service chaining information. When I want to redirect the traffic via a certain service like firewall, load balancer, van optimizer, IPS, IDS, that's what we call a service training in SD WAN. It's, it's a big feature in, in Cisco. So this is that information is also exchanged via the VSmart. Distribution of data plane security security parameters, VPN labels, and crypto keys. Yeah. Using OMP, we also do key management, key exchange. In general, we use ISACAMP to do the key exchange in SD-WAN. Not only really that, there's a very cool feature that Cisco flaunted it. Application aware routing, they also use this one for uh, exchange the information of application aware routing from the vSmart to the vanish routers, right? That was your control plane. Now let's talk about the data plane. Now we talk, we just understood that OMP keys and updates the policies are exchanged via these right DTLS type of connections. But also we are going to form IPsec tunnel as well with our vanish router. And the actual data package from when sourced from the VPN one, this A destination to C will be taking this IPsec tunnel actually. Now, defining a traffic engineering, you can you can tell this router, you know, I don't want to use load balancing. That's what it will do by default. You can say, I always want to send the traffic via transport one first. And in case if the, the you know, the track traffic of 
or the performance of the transport one have degraded, I want to send the traffic via transport route. Now that's what we call application level routing. It's it's calculating the performance of the van circuits in there. And the key exchange that we do, I've taken an example. For example, we have VH1, VH2, and VH3. Now they have built the IPsec tunnels, as you can see. So VH1 have a key that it is generated. It is sending via an OMP session. Via OMP update is sending it to the vSmart. And vSmart is the one that is going to send to the Vanage routers. What are they going to do with it? Whenever they want to communicate directly, directly to the Vanage one routers, they are going to use these keys now. Right? Separate keys are generated for separate transport. That is a very important point. Each key lifetime is 12 hours, but it's not like they generate every 24 hours. Uh, each key's lifetime is 24 hours. They have to regenerate every 12 hours. But if it's not generating, it can keep the older key for 24 hours only. After that, it is invalid. Okay. And how is the communication happening? The communication happening via these keys. When VH1 wants to send some data to VH2, look at this. It's going to say, do we have any key received from the vSmart? Okay, we have a key received from the vSmart that was for VH2, in fact. So we take this key, encrypt the data, and send over our IPsec tunnel. Look at this, the traffic is going, is the traffic encrypted and decrypted with a key too. So we send it towards VH2. VH2 have generated locally key. It knows what it's, uh, what key it has generated. So it's going to use this key to decrypt the data and it's going to accept that. Same thing is going to happen. The communication from VH2 to VH1 is going to use the key that received via the vSmart that is generated by the VH1. So this is a very small example of how the IPsec tunnels are built in here. So, yeah, that's that. Now let's see. Whenever you want to define application aware routing, traffic engineering, the control connection policy, when you want to define hub and spoke topology, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to define hub and spoke topology. Otherwise, what happens? Now, if you got, let's say you got three Vantage routers, three branched routers, they will form the full mesh topology. Out of that, you might have a DC router. We are going to use the topology very similar to this. We have DC site. Site 10 is Dubai site. 20 is Los Angeles, LA site. Before that, let's understand how the policies are attached on these devices. So we, we are going to define a policy on the graphical user interface of the vManager. And the policy that we want to be learning today is a centralized deployment policy. And the policy, this centralized policy is always attached to the vSmart. Okay. And a vSmart having, because name of the policy also makes sense. This is it's vSmart is the one who has a central view. So it can fool anyone. What do I mean by fool anyone? If I have LAN 1 and LAN 2 routes, it's saying I'm the one next hop. It's attaching a route and sending it to the vSmart. Everybody who's receiving that route is going to communicate to this next hop. Basically, the transport locator or the T lock. Now, vSmart have a power to tell while sending this route to this specific site, you know what? The, the next hop should be this hub. So instead of communicating to this, this device is trying to communicate to this. It doesn't care. It knows the next hub is hub, so it will send the data to hub. And hub have the full view in this case. So hub is going to send actual next hub. You can do, do this when you want to perform hub and spoke routing. 
So only one fact you should know by this slide is that we attach a centralized policy defined on vManage, push it to the vSmart, and vSmart is going to, uh, you know, because of this centralized picture, it is going to define a control policy and not have the default behavior. And we can multi create multiple type of policies in it. So imagination is a limit actually. So type of policy in centralized policy we are going to use, it's actually the control policy. And the control policies has to be deployed in site. You have to select which site. It might be site 10, site 20. And where you want to apply the in or out direction. Why? Because it matters. If you change, if you apply the, some policy in incoming direction, vSmart's own routing table is going to change. Now, if it's sending the route to site 20, but also site 20 as well as hub, everyone is receiving what has been changed in incoming update. Because as per the vSmart, this is the best information, which is has which has been manipulated actually. So in here, we are going to apply it in outbound direction, let's say. So only the site you have selected and outbound direction, only those sites will have the manipulated information. Others are not going to have that manipulated information. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Inbound policies determine which routes are installed in the routing table of the vSmart controller. All of them are sending these T lock routes. Let's say all these are installed into the vSmarts because it also contains, even if it's a centralized database, even if it has a central view of everything, it has to store every information in there. Okay, so one thing, vSmart is going to store all this information into its routing table as well. So what we are looking at for control traffic engineering is control policies with just few click of a button, or you also have an option. If you don't want to define a graphical user interface policy, you can use a CLI policy as well. That is, you can directly define a policy on vSmart and right there from it, you can push it to the vanish routers. There is no involvement of the vManager. But if you decided to configure on vManage, it, it will be enabled and enforced on vSmart controllers. The control policies do not get forwarded to the vanish routers. And whenever we send an OMP information, whatever the information we have manipulated, that's information or routing information is going to be sent via the OMP update to the van edge routers. You can do this uh, to have, you know, this is actually really detailed and powerful behavior. With very, very simple clicks, few clicks, you can define complex topologies like hub and spoke topology. I was surprised to see the, how much control it is offering you. You can say, you know what? I have a VPN 10. Using the control policy, you can say VPN 10 traffic should be going via the hub. Via the hub before it goes to another VPN 10 site. You can say VPN 20 on the other hand is a guest VPN. It should not even have a communication to other sites. So it should be direct internet access and exited to the internet directly. And this kind of behavior you can uh, define using the control policies, traffic engineering, accelerate VPN, service chaining. And if you want to have a per VPN topology, so you can deploy these arbitrary VPN topologies as well. Service and path affinity, right? The high availability, load balancing, all the options you have available. Now let's start seeing a few examples on how the traffic engineering is defined. So we got some problem in here. One of this policy is actually telling arbitrary VPN topology. That means we are going to define the same example. For VPN 10, I might have a different topology. VPN 10, I might have a different topology. That's what they're saying. So in this company, they're having VPN 1 and VPN 2. 
And the problem they are presenting us, different VPNs must be provided with a different connectivity based on applications being serviced in each VPN. For different VPNs, different type of connectivity based on applications. So VPN one having the customer relationship management software, CRM software. So it should have the habits book topology. We got VPN site, uh, sorry, site one, site two and site three. And you got the data center here. And look at this, the VPN one, that's your CRM. That's your CRM. 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 By default, what will happen? Everybody can communicate directly right, to each other. We don't want that to happen. Rather, they're telling us they should be communicating from this VPN. If they want to go to this VPN, they should be going to this DC first and they should be going like this. Okay. Second VPN two is, is for use for voice only. And that's the full mesh. I mean, full mesh is the same behavior I talked about. I mean, it's a default one. So we don't have to do anything. VPN two, no filter. All the prefixes are advertised to every node on VPN two. But for VPN one, let's see what I'm doing. On vSmart, via the CLI, I'm not managing the vSmart from the manager on the GUI. So I'm going to log into the vSmart and configuring a policy now. In the policy section, first I'm defining my interest. Very similar to the route maps we apply. First of all, we match the traffic using IP access list, prefix list. Here I'm matching the site IDs. I've created a site ID called branches where I'm matching all their site IDs, site one, two, three. Another VPN I've created, site list, CRM. Actually, this is just the name of the list, very similar to IP access list, and then you have a name. Actual interested traffic is in here, site ID one, two, three, and there is a VPN one. Look at this, VPN one was actually a CRM. So we have interested a group of list. Now let's define the control policy. In the control policy, you have two type of sequence either the route or the T log. Here, we don't have to worry about T log type of routes, right? Transport routes, right? The route, actually the land side of routes, these are the routes we are very interested in. VPN one routes from all these three branches. What I'm saying, we have added a sequence 10. I've named it an arbitrary topology. Sequence 10 match route. Basically, this is the first type of sequence that it supports. I just have talked about this one. Either you can match t -rock or you can match route. So matching route, I'm saying VPN list CRM. This is nothing but a reference to the VPN one. I just called out the CRM in here. Another thing I'm saying, site list branches. I'm calling out VPN one of site one to three. Okay, I'm just matching it. What do I wanna do with that one? I'm going to reject them. Action is reject. And everything else that is not matching in here should be accepted. It's like permit, implicit permit at the very end. And this is the magic. We go to the apply policy section. Where are we applying it? We are not applying it to the DC, only to site one, two, and three. What's happening? Vsmart is sending this policy, right? Only to the site one, two, three. As a result, what will happen? They will not receive anything that is matched in here. VPN one traffic of branch one. Two, three. But since there is permit, everything permit at the end, they will receive the DC routes of VPN one also. So having the only route of DC, they will only communicate to the DC. Right? How you can do and what about the routes of these VPN? You can inject a default route from the DC. You can send a DC default route, and using that default route, they can send the traffic to the you see, and from there it knows full information. So it will send the traffic to the correct VPN there. Another example, service insertion. This is what we call a service chaining. The default behavior says when you have a site and when you have a certain VPN defined, 
right? And they want to communicate to another VPN one on the other side, they will use their tunnels directly to communicate there. The problem here says certain de departments require firewall protection when interacting with a data center networks. Uh, this is the data center network. There is only certain part of it. For VPN2, they can communicate directly from site 10 to data center, from data center to site 10, that's fine. But VPN10, VPN1 traffic, right? Certain departments require firewall protection when interacting with the data center, while other departments do not. That's your VPN2. That's other department. So we are going to deploy a service training policy. What are we doing? Look at this. First of all, we define a service. The interested routers are site 10 and data center. That's fine. But it is another router called regional hub. Behind that, our firewall is sitting actually. So this is part of actually the VPN one. In the VPN one, I'm going to use a service command. Just use some predefined words to advertise any service. It doesn't matter. You have some predefined like a firewall load balancer and all that, but you, they got custom service net SDC one like this. That's your firewall and you're using the address. This is the address of 10.0.1.1 of the firewall actually. So first of all, you define the service. So this is the third type of route that sd uses. We call them service route. It is sent to the vSmart and vSmart is going to use it in the policies. First of all, define the interested traffic. We have a list. The site list actually is, let's call it a site 10. Okay, the site ID 10. This is very similar to the IP access uh, name, right? That's it. They don't hold any other significance for this one. A control policy, firewall service, I named it, sequence 10. Again, I'm matching the route. I'm matching VPN one. You can directly match the site IDs in here, or you can, uh, you know, define the list here and then call those lists. Any way will work. But I'm matching the first type of routing control policy. First is route. Second is TLOC. TLOC we did not use yet. So match route, VPN one, site ID one. I'm I'm calling out to the data center site of VPN one. Okay. And what do we want to do, do with this one? After matching it, we are accepting it. Accept action is set the service. That means whatever the service we have already with this name in the VPN one. Now this will have one effect actually. The T lock will be changed to the regional T lock because of this. And default action is accept. Everything else is not affected by anything. What we have mentioned in here, only the traffic of site ID one and VPN one is affected by this only. What where we are applying it, we are applying it to the site list firewall inspected. We are applying it to okay, firewall inspected is a site name. Actually, we are referring to the site then. So this policy is what we are saying VPN one traffic of site one, when we send it, instead of sending the next hop as this router, send the regional hub. So it will send the traffic to here first. And it knows that actually the next hop is 10.01.1. So it will just perform a routing actually. Firewall is receiving it and is going to perform the firewall uh, stuff, security and all that scanning and send back to the vanish router and vanish router is going to send the data. That's what this red arrow is telling us. And this is only for, we just applied the policy towards the site 10, but site one is not affected by it. Site one is thinking, and that's the next drop if I want to communicate to the VPN one trap. Same thing is happening for, now we are going to apply the policy, like site list is DC, because we have to tell now site 10 traffic of VPN one, if you want to go that, there is a service actually that you have to go through. So they are receiving this, like look at this, it's applied in the outbound direction. 
So first policy that we deployed was communication from the site 10 to the DC. This policy is for site 10, uh, so DC to the site 10. One of the last example I'm gonna take up uh, on this one is a DC router preference. So we got one vanish router. Then, and one vanish router that is 20. So that's your site 10 and site 20. As of right now, and the DC, at the DC, we got two vanish routers, 11 and 12. And from their land side, from this DC internet router, actually they are receiving, understand this, this DC internet gigabit one IP have 172.16.1.0 .1 and it is forming OSPF neighborship. This is the broadcast network actually. With router 11 and 12, it has formed the neighborship. And over this OSPF, what we are doing actually, we are advertising a default route. So our 11, so DCVH 11 and 12, both of them in VPN 10, they will receive a default route. Anybody who have VPN 10 now is going to also receive that default. Okay, now let's understand the problem. Prefer DCVH 11 for the route, that's a default route, and this connected network as well, that is advertised by default. So these two subnets, one default and one connected network over DC, from the DC, uh, we always should be preferring the DCVH11 over DCVH12. So they should always send the traffic to 11, right? So we are going to deploy the control policy, but not the, uh, the control policy, which is type of route. We are not going to type match route now. We are going to match the T log. Let's look at this. Very first thing, we are going to define the interested traffic. The policy, the list is there. Site lists, branches. Site ID, 10 and 20. So I matched the site ID 10 and 20, and I'm calling them branches site. I'm going to define another type of list. This is the list of the transport route that it has generated for the MPLS connection and sent to the vSmart. These three connections, actually the controllers, they are going to communicate to. So I'm going to name it a DCVH11. The T lock is actually not the public IP of this MPLS interface rather than uh, the, this is just the end point. This is a reference point. Actually, this is a system IP. Look at this, this is a system IP of router 11. The router is sending, generating this uh, interface T lock route and sending to the vSmart. It has very detailed information in it. Okay, so this is just a reference. Inside of it, it has many information. The color, color is again, uh, for the WAN circuit, the SD WAN lets you sign colors. There are only two type of colors: the private and uh, and public. Since MPLS is forming private uh, type of circuit, we are going to assign MPLS. It also has uh, Metro Ethernet and all some, some custom ones as well. And encapsulation IP set. So basically, I'm referring to this uh, circuit route that DCVH11 generated. We did not even match DCVH12. What's happening? When they generated the route, both of them is sending the route to the vSmart with a preference of zero. I'm saying, match the T lock route of this specifically 11 router and accept it and then set the preference to 50. And default lecture is accept. So this is not uh, affected by it. We are going to process it as we are doing it before. But when we are, you know, this route is going to be applied a preference of 50. It's not a data route. It's not a land subnet route. This is the route of transport. T-lock route. When we are applying it, we are applying it to the 
branches that is we are applying in the out down direction of the branches what we are applying we are up, we are sending everything as it is but when we are sending the t lock route right since we have matched the t lock route of 11 specifically set the preference to 50 that's what it means as a result what's happening as a result both of them look at this there is a default route and we are receiving it from the vsmart that's vsmart peer and we are seeing like there is a space set right so this is actually two routes we are getting the first one have the status cir which is received via t lock ip after 11 cir means is chosen installed and resolved r on the other hand we received another t lock it's this second line represents the same route is received via the router 12 as well but it's not preferable it's not installed it's very similar to checking the show ip of database we are checking the omp database this is not the routing table actually we are seeing all the possible re received information but only this information is going because having the install flag we smart is sending both routes of dc vanish router but only the routes of that is going with the router 11 having CIR flag. Why this is happening? It's happening. So this is we are checking OMP route. Now let's check it. Let's check the T lock routes. If I do check show OMP T lock of router 11 or vanish 11, look at the, what is it we are preferring. So actually, I I changed the policy at the time when I took this, I have set it hundred actually. But in the in the configuration, I have set 50 here. It's a typo, in fact. So 100 is a preference. We have received the transport locator route with the preference 100. It's like a next hop preference, you can say. At the same time, router 12 preference is set to zero. Right? So despite receiving the same route from DC 11 and 12, the router is installing only the DC 11 route in the FIP table as well. So this is your OMP database. Look at it. What is in what is going in the FIP table? Only the next hop. This is actually the public IP of MPLS router of 11. This 192.161.11. T log is R11. Just a quick summary. The policy was applied in outbound direction. Right out of vSmart. So vSmart changed the preference of matched only matched router with a hundred. This T lock was sent to the sites only because this list having the site list 10 and 20. What if we change the list? At the time of definition, I said site 10 and 20 having the branches. I just changed the list to only site 10. Okay, site list branches which is site ID 10. Now there is no site 20. Application we did not change as it is. What we changed only the list. So now the policy as it is, is not applied to 20, only to 10. So what's happening because of this, when we check the same route on site 20, show IP fib 170 to 1.0. What are we seeing? We are seeing in the fib, table we are installing the same route and performing the load balancer look at the next hop router 11 and router 12 as well as opposed to dubai router it is only preferring the router 11 and because we removed from the site list the site 20 it is preferring for the same route it is preferring router 11 and 12 as well Let's make, uh, let's play around with this. What's actually happening. I went ahead and I shut down the interface of GE0 slash zero of router 11. Because of that, what's happening? The, this is actually site 10, which should be affected by it. We are saying we have two possible destinations, but router 11 is right now invalid and unresolved. 
for this route as well, the router 11, we can go wide, but it's invalid. That means the public IP that we are trying to reach is not valid anymore. Only in that case, we are installing, the, look at this route, router 12. We make that interface up and commit, and what's happening? We're back to router 11. So this is just a consider it as a trailer only of how, how many type of topologies we can create uh, using the SD-WAN. We just saw traffic engineering uh, policies for the control traffic using the vSmart. If you're interested on more things, uh, reach out to us over LinkedIn or uh, website on nitishsharma.com as well. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to assist you over the one more demo on it as well.